Good to see you, everyone. My name is Robbie Howell. I am a game designer and a history enthusiast, and I absolutely love Age of Empires 2. If you are new here, welcome. If you're old here, can't wait to hear your thoughts on this particular one, because today we will be covering what is, in my opinion, the single biggest miss in Age of Empires 2 civilization design. That being the fact that the Chinese are one civilization. We had the Indians recently subdivided, and I think that China really, really deserves the same treatment. But without further ado, allow me to introduce today's civilization theorycraft, the Jurchens. So who are the Jurchens exactly? Well, that will be explained shortly, but for now, suffice to say that they will be derived from the current Chinese civilization as one of a great many hypothetical splits that can be done as some sort of India-style DLC. As always, a comprehensive civilization document featuring all of the links I used in my research for this project will be featured in the description box down below. Take a look at it if you want to see any of the numbers underneath the hood. Without further ado, let's move on, but not before we take a quick look at the usual disclaimers. I am not a historian. I'm just a hobbyist game designer. All of my designs are untested. I do not have the skill to implement them in the game. This is a blind build. I did not consult or rip off any other builds of the Jurchens that might be floating around there on the internet. And as a game designer, I tend to like complexity, I tend to want to increase variety, and I like being as faithful to history on a one-to-one -one level as possible. I like to be literal when translating history into game mechanics. And speaking of history, let's jump into the history of the Jurchen peoples. So when we are talking about the Jurchens, we are mostly going to be focusing on the 1000 to 1600 AD time range. They existed, they certainly existed before then, but they didn't really have civilizational ambitions until this time frame begins. At the beginning of this period, though, the Jurchens were fairly well known among their neighbors for being general pests. They had a tendency of raiding all sorts of other Northeastern Asian peoples, punching into Chinese lands, messing around with their fellow Turco-Mongolic neighbors, attacking Korea on many occasions, and even going over the seas to pirate the coast of Japan, which when I learned, I was very surprised by. You don't usually hear about Japan being invaded, but the Jurchens did it. But during this entire period, the Jurchen peoples were largely disunified. They were a bunch of squabbling clans who all had a vaguely similar way of life that they kind of committed to to different degrees. That was all to change in around the 1100s AD, when one of the Jurchen clans, the Wanyan clan, managed to unite all the tribes through sword and diplomacy alike, and suddenly found themselves in possession of one of the largest, most mobile armies that was known in this part of the world. Because the Jurchen peoples, pretty much every member of a clan, was able to ride, hunt, and fight. And so, when the Wanyan clan rose to power, they immediately turned their sights on the greatest prize that Northeastern Asia had to offer, that being China. Now, when we're talking about China at this time, it was actually divided pretty substantially into a number of different sub-empires. But to keep things simple, North China was owned by the Liao dynasty. And the Liao were not actually ethnically Chinese. They were technically a Mongolic people. You may know them from AoE2 as being the Karakitai, for they are without honor, that you fight in the early Genghis Khan scenarios. And these same Liao owned most of northern China at the time and were very, very powerful. But that didn't stop the Jurchens from swarming in like a storm and booting them the hell out back to their old homelands. And with that, the Jurchens established themselves as the rulers of northern China, the single strongest power in all of East Asia in the space of less than a century. And in taking over China, they took on the name of the Jin Dynasty, the same Jin that you fight in Genghis Khan. Three, but more on that later. Now, as you might expect, they gained an awful lot of power seated atop their new throne. And still having that very active, very ready military who really didn't like being forced to sit still rather than go out and fight and hunt like their typical tribal traditions dictated, they started looking for other places to conquer. The obvious place to go was south, which was owned by the Song Dynasty. And the Jin ended up fighting the Song for over a century. 
Now, this war cannot be easily summarized in the amount of time that I have to dedicate to it. Suffice to say for now that not only were there incredible victories and incredible tragedies on both sides, but the two enemies were so interlocked in combat that they began to rapidly iterate through military technology in order to get a one-up on each other. In fact, the Jin Song Wars are possibly the first recorded example of extensively used gunpowder weapons on a medieval battlefield. So in summary, the Jurchen Jin, even though they control most of China, are now locked in this brutal war versus the Song, which they are nowhere near winning anytime soon. And during this time, things begin to get a lot worse. Not only did they have a couple of really weak leaders, not only are divisions starting to grow within the formerly unified Jurchen peoples, but also other powers with greedy eyes planted on the Chinese throne were starting to rise westward. For one, Tatar peoples started to harry the western fronts of the Jurchen territories, but much more threatening was the upcoming monster that was Genghis Khan. During this time, he had been obviously uniting the Mongolic tribes in a very similar way to how the Wanyan clan had united the Jurchens and swept down into the Jin state during the latter years of the Jin Song Wars. This was not something that the Jurchens were ready to defend against. They were split across multiple fronts. The native Chinese peasantry were starting to rebel against them. Their own people didn't really want to be in the seat of power and wanted to return to their old nomadic lifestyle. It was an unmitigated disaster and eventually pretty much all of the Jurchen leadership were killed, captured, or just renounced their titles. And all of this boiled down to Genghis Khan taking over northern China, installing his own dynasties on the throne, and the Jurchens scurrying back off to their former homes in the northeast. Now, over the next couple centuries, not a whole lot happened. The Mongol dynasties came and went, eventually replaced by the more properly Chinese Ming peoples. And the Jurchens all the while had somewhat gone all the way back to where they had started as nomadic hunter-gatherers. They interacted fairly frequently with the Ming, were largely a tributary state to the Ming, and sometimes raided them, sometimes fought alongside them. It was a fairly standard medieval relationship at the time. And the Ming were fairly interested by the Jurchen peoples, classifying them into a couple of different categories. The wild Jurchens, who were just about as savage as you could get for this particular time period, and who were, to the snooty and civilized Ming at the very least, utter barbarians. Then there were the High Sea Jurchens, who were somewhere between wild and civilized, and lastly, the Jiangzhuo Jurchens. These ones had adopted almost a Ming way of life, with extensive agriculture and well-fortified townships, but they still hung on to a couple of the old Jurchen traditions, such as their religion and their social structure, not to mention their love of riding, hunting, and archery. However, the old memories of Jurchen dominance had not left the collective minds, and there were a number of small uprisings and minor leadership bids made by Jurchen nobles and clan leaders that didn't really go much of anywhere. Not to mention, this period marked the coming of a great many foreign powers into East Asia, such as the Dutch, if you'd like to see my build on them, go check out the link up here, and of course the Portuguese, who are getting their grubby little fingers into just about every corner of the globe at this point. And with all of these interesting influences, an air of uncertainty started to fall over East Asia, and this was capitalized upon by yet another charismatic Jurchen clan leader. This was a fellow named Nur Hachi, who we will get into a little bit later, who, much like his predecessors centuries before, reunified the Jurchen peoples in 1583 and launched a war against the Ming that would end after Nur Hachi's death in the Jurchen peoples reconquering China ruling it as the Qing Dynasty, which, as you may remember from your history classes in high school, ruled well into the 1900s AD, just before World War I. One hell of a legacy for a people who were largely considered barbarians. Jurchen history is filled with fascinating characters, not to mention tons upon tons of action. But before we jump into those, a few notes on the flavor of the civilization as I would implement them in-game. Their architecture would be a new variety, that being a North Asian variety, which they would share it with the Mongols and the Huns. This North Asian architecture would be somewhere between the steppe architecture East Asian architecture, and a little bit entirely of its own. Hopefully to get something that feels distinctly Asian, while also having a more nomadic vibe to it, which better suits these primarily nomadic peoples. 
Huns in particular are in desperate need of an architecture upgrade, and I think that this one in particular would be a great way of unifying some of these fascinating Turco-Mongolic peoples together. Although, of course, the Jurchens are Tunguzic, which is still connected to the Turco-Mongolic ethnic group. On the subject of architecture, they'd also have some unique skins, uh, specifically for the house, the castle, as per usual, and the monk. Now, something interesting about the Northeast Asian Tunguzic peoples, the Jurchens in particular, their religions were primarily female-led, with shamanesses being their primary source of religious authority. As such, I'd want Jurchen monks to be female, and perhaps all North Asian monks. I believe that similar religious traditions were held by the Mongols and similar Mongolic peoples, but I don't know that one for sure, so either this would be something that all North Asian civilizations would share as part of their architecture set, or just the Jurchens themselves would have. But either way, I really like it. Moving on, uh, their language would be Manchu, Sayun, everyone. Manchu would obviously be a later incarnation of true Tunguzic Jurchen languages. However, it's close enough and should be a relatively easy language to research, whereas I could find literally nothing about pre-Manchurian Jurchen languages. Their wonder would be the Linji Temple. Uh, this is a monument that was constructed way back during, I believe, the Jin era, uh, which still stands today. It's beautiful, it's distinct, and it looks very different from other East Asian wonders, which I'm hoping will allow it to stand out. And on to campaigns. There are no shortage of fantastic campaign protagonists for the Jurchens, but I'll stick to just the three storylines I think would do the best in Age of Empires 2. To start with, you have to begin with the OG, Wanyan Aguda. This guy was the head of the Wanyan clan that first unified the Jurchens, led them into northern China, and founded the Jin Dynasty. I don't believe Aguda himself ever became an emperor. He might have. Fact check me on that one. But uh, he was a crucial part of the clan unification process. Among the many enemies that you would face in a Wanyan Aguda campaign would be fellow Jurchens during the clan reunifications, the Koreans during his harrying of the Joseon border, the Kitan Liao, of course, though the Kitans are not yet represented in-game. That is a civilization I'd like to tackle in future. And a little bit of other Chinese resistance once he started to establish himself within his new domain. Aguda was not alone among the Wanyan clan in leading this first great Jurchen invasion, but he is the figure who is most central to the process and I think would make a great figurehead around which a campaign would be formed, albeit a fairly conventional one. For a slightly more unconventional campaign, we'd have to look not to a single person, but to an entire century of history, that being the Jin Song Wars. As I alluded to earlier, not only was this one of the longest and bloodiest wars in the world's history, seeing many iterations in technology, countless defeats and victories on either side, and a gigantic rotating cast of characters, but it would also feature battles on just about every variety of terrain you could possibly imagine. This would allow the Jurchen's military to be tested on all variety of different battlefields, allowing you to really exhibit tactical brilliance while controlling one of a great cast of various Jurchen generals across the century that the wars were taking place. I'd say the only downside of the Jin Song Wars, besides the fact that people tend to prefer single protagonists for their campaigns, would be that you would mostly be playing as Jurchen Jin fighting against Song Chinese, which would make for relatively limited civ variety. That is a big downside, even though I love the actual campaign content and the historical topic at play, and so if there was any way of spicing it up by focusing maybe on lesser known battles or taking a few creative liberties, I could see that being an acceptable price to pay for allowing us to play through the Jin Song Wars in Age of Empires 2. Moving on, however, to another named protagonist, we'd be looking at the man Nurhatsi himself. As mentioned, he was a unifying leader of the Jurchens way later in the 1500s, who is almost solely responsible for the second great Jurchen dynasty leading China, namely the Great Qing Dynasty. He first came onto the scene as a general working for the Ming Chinese, eventually realizing a power vacuum was starting to be present, fomenting discontent among his fellow Jurchens, and then presenting the Chinese with a list of demands that he knew they wouldn't act upon, giving him justification to go launch a war. And while you would, again, be mostly fighting Chinese in this campaign, there would be plenty of other civilizations at play that you could spice it up with, especially the Koreans, who Nurhachi fought quite often, both when he was a general under the Ming, and also a little later on when he was a leader of the Jurchen peoples. 
An important note about Nur Hatsi, however, is that his campaign would technically carry well into the 1600s AD, which, in my personal opinion, is beyond the Age of Empires II relevant timeframe. As such, a campaign starring Nur Hatsi would be a bit of a cliffhanger, leading you right up to the turn of the 17th century and then cutting short before the whole thing can be fully realized. It should still make for some great action and some fantastic set pieces, but it might be a little bit of a blue ball for players, so I could see if that wasn't the campaign that was gone with for that particular reason. But besides starring in their own campaigns, there are a handful of other existing campaigns that I could see the Jurchens slotting into. Chief among them would be the Genghis Khan campaign. Not only would they play one of the central factions in the third scenario into China, I could see them subbing in for the Mongols in a couple of the earlier scenarios just to kind of vary the sieves a little more than just having it be an only Mongol fiesta. Additionally, I can see them featuring in the Lake Poyang historical battle, specifically as the pirates. The Jurchens did have some great lake battles during the Jinsong Wars, but the Lake Poyang scenario comes well after those, and so I think that them featuring as the pirates would still allow them to have a part to play in the affair, while also giving the scenario a little more civ variety without going too far in rewriting history. Lastly, the first Tamerlane scenario features a couple of other Turco-Mongolic factions, one of which I think could very much feature the Jurchens in a similar way to that Genghis Khan example I gave, so not a ton of existing campaigns could feature the Jurchens very prominently, but before we move on to the next section, there are a couple of other potential campaign ideas that I had that I thought might be cool to mention. The first of them being the Toy Invasion. This was that Jurchen pirate attack on Japan that I was mentioning earlier. Definitely not a campaign, this would be a single historical battle. But not only would it let us see the Japanese fighting non-Japanese for once, but it would also let us see the Jurchens in a different light. Not just the horse raiders that they would mostly be during their campaigns in China, but pirates blitzing into Japan, grabbing as many slaves as they can, and fleeing while being pursued back across the high seas. Really, really cool concept. I think it would work great, even if it can't lend itself to more than a single scenario. Additionally, you have Emperor Aizong. This was one of the later Jurchen Jin emperors, and he ruled the Jurchen Jin during its downfall. There were all sorts of problems happening during his reign. He was trying to kind of patch up cracks as they appeared, and he was generally considered to have been a good ruler during a bad time. Now, it's not usually fun to play as the loser, but I think that a dramatic and well-done Emperor Aizong campaign where you just kind of saw the beautiful Jin dynasty crumbling around you could be really poignant and also feature a lot of civ variety because this was around the time when the Tatars and the Mongols were starting to come into the picture as well as the Song. So I think he would be pretty cool. And lastly, Mang Temu. Now this was a fellow who featured during the Ming rule in China. The Ming were in fairly close contact with the Jurchens and often made use of their services and milked them for tribute. Mang Temu was one of the few early Jurchen rulers during this time, or clan leaders, I suppose, who tried to resist Ming rule, but he did so fairly subtly. Not only did he kind of play them against the Joseon dynasty and kind of picked the side that was most convenient at the time, uh, but he also was one of the only Jurchen rulers at the time to enter armed conflict with the Ming on an actual battlefield rather than in raiding. He's a cool character, a bit of a swashbuckler, which I think is kind of funky, but he is a relatively lesser known and insignificant figure in history, so if we wanted something obscure, I think Mang Temu is a great pick, but otherwise, I think that his role is better filled by Nurhatsi or Wanyan Agoda. With that all being said, let's conclude the flavor and history section with a bit of a roundup of the major themes I noticed while learning about Jurchen history. And fortunately, this one is fairly straightforward. The first big theme that you see in Jurchen history is the unification of the clans. This happened twice in order to conquer China. It happened a couple of other minor times to resist specific threats. But when the Jurchens were united, they could accomplish anything. Even when they were ruling China, their army structure actually fought followed and replicated the clan and hunting party structures that they were used to. A group of people bound by blood working together in the face of great opposition. And the way that they worked together was with horses. 
horses, and bows. Even their Mongol neighbors would buy horses from them because they were the best at breeding them in the region. And many Turco-Mongolic peoples were great at horsemanship and archery, but the Jurchens in particular brought a new element to it. By having their army structure follow clan structure and having hunting be one of the main ways they trade for war, it allowed them to have these very nimble hit-and-run units that were all autonomously operated. They didn't have to listen to a lead general, and each were entrusted to kind of function under its own best judgment, which allowed them to be extremely adaptable. The autonomy that was given to these clan units also allowed Jurchen warriors to be fiercely loyal, because you weren't just letting down some faceless general when you fled or failed, you were letting down your family members. And that allowed them to outperform other units through sheer endurance and willpower alone in some scenarios. And lastly, Jurchen history is constantly pervaded by the conflict between tribal life versus civilized life. When they first started to take over China, even before that, in the divisions between the wild Jurchens and the civil Jurchens, there was this innate conflict where the civil Jurchens would realize the benefits of living a more modern lifestyle with agriculture and clothing and nice things like that, and the wild Jurchens wanting to stay true to their animist religion, to their strict clan hierarchy, and to their fiercely independent spirit. The Jurchens historically had the most success when they were in a civil role and preserved their tribal ways of life at the same time. For example, among many of the early Jin rulers, they were expected to fulfill tribal obligations in addition to running China. They would have to go out and shoot with a bow to prove they were still competent of doing so. They had to go out and pay homage to their animist customs, which is something that the local Chinese thought was incredibly barbaric. And only later on, when later Jurchen rulers would start to try to act more Chinese, did a lot of the other clan leaders who surrounded them start to lose faith in their ability and lose faith in their loyalty to the Jurchen people as a whole. And with that, we come to the end of the history section for the Jurchens. Thank you so very much for watching. If this was all you were here for, please remember to leave a like and a comment before you go. For everyone else who, like me, love Age of Empires and want to see how the Jurchen might appear in-game, let's move on to the game mechanics. What would the Jurchens look like at a glance. Well, to start with, the Jurchen are a cavalry and cavalry archer civilization. Their first bonus gives them a staggered series of non-cumulative food-gathering bonuses across the first three ages. In the Dark Age, their foragers, fishermen, and hunters are better. Then, in Feudal Age, their shepherds are better. And lastly, in Castle Age, their farmers are better. But in Imperial Age, they get no benefits. This not only represents the kind of scaling progression of Jurchen civility in a way that is as true to history as I could make it, because the Jurchens were known to be incredible hunters excellent farmers and fantastic fishermen pretty much all at the same time. The second bonus is that their houses can be individually upgraded into fortified houses. We'll get into what these look like a little later, but suffice to say for now that most Jurchen towns had every single building possess defensive fortifications. This was because they raided each other all the time, and you really needed to get the women and children and animals into a protected area. Third bonus, their cavalry archers and step lancers have bonus line of sight and cost a little less gold. These two units would have made up the core of almost all Jurchen armies during the vast majority of their history, and as such, it made sense to not only make them a little bit more affordable for the player, but also to improve their eyesight to represent the Jurchen's training through hunting parties. And for their last civilization bonus, all of their stable technologies cost minus 50%. They were incredible with everything to do with horses, so this one should mostly explain itself. And in addition to all that, their team bonus is that their advance to the feudal age is 33% cheaper. And again, this applies to their entire team. As mentioned, the Jurchens had a bit of a stratified society during their pre-imperial years, but when they began to come together, things started moving very quickly. This team bonus is trying to represent the way that once the Jurchens started to unify together, hence it being a team bonus, they were able to improve their technology, their political influence, and their inter-clan coordination very, very rapidly, far more than their neighbors could ever have expected. Moving on from here to their unique units, let's begin with the Tie Huo Pao. This is a mounted grenadier unit who would function similarly to an Arambai. They're very expensive with a high gold cost and a low food cost. And like an Arambai, they would have terrible accuracy, but very good damage. More importantly, their damage is explosive. 
While it is true that in the current game, area of effect units cannot miss their shots, I think an exception could be made for a unit like the Arambi, and I don't anticipate their grenade having a very large blast radius. It would, however, be more than enough for them to absolutely rip through tightly packed formations, making them deadly against everything from infantry swarms to massed archers to a whole bunch of step lancers all stacked up on top of each other. The Jurchens actually did invent the iron grenade during the Jin Song Wars, which the Song Chinese later copied. Like I said, they kind of iterated back and forth against each other quite a lot during this period, and the Tie Hua Pao was one of the most emblematic weapons during that entire conflict that I thought made a really cool pairing to the rest of the Jurchen's military aesthetic. As with all unique units, they do upgrade in Imperial Age, and their upgrade cost is not too bad. Very heavy on wood, which is fortunate because they don't cost any wood in the first place. Secondly, we're going to talk about the Iron Pagoda Lancer. This is a unique upgrade to the Elite Step Lancer available only to the Jurchens, and it makes the Step Lancer into a monster. This would increase the HP, the armor, the attack of the Step Lancer to the point where it can even rival a Paladin in terms of its raw stats. The Iron Pagoda would also have a small attack bonus versus cavalry. Not very much, but enough to be noticeable in even fights. The reason for this will be explained a little bit later. However, their upgrade is immensely expensive, even more so than Paladin, though it is discounted by the Jurchen's unique stable tech reduction bonus. So you're paying 800 gold, 800 food to turn your elite step lancers into these absolute tanks on hooves. It's going to be one of the Jurchen's best options in post-imperial scenarios, but it's unlikely you will get to it very often outside of those very, very late game situations. Last unique thing to go over for the Jurchens is the Fortified House. This would be available for 25 wood and 25 stone from the Dark Age. How you would make it is you would click on any given house and there would be a little button in the house's command card. And if you click on that button, it would display a build animation over the house. No villager would be needed. The wood and stone cost would be expended and then the house would very slowly upgrade itself. The upside, you don't have to spend villager time. The downside, it's really slow and you can't speed it up by using multiple villagers. The perks of the fortified house is that it's very tough especially for a Dark Age building. It counts as a stone defense, meaning that it can be used to really effectively wall if you can plop one right in a choke point, or you can upgrade just one house that your enemies happen to be trying to push through. They even gain a weak attack starting in Feudal Age, a lot weaker than a watchtower, but it would have its range and damage increase as you aged up. Still being rather unremarkable in Imperial Age, but you know, noticeable enough to ward off a couple of raiders. So the Fortified House would be a major part of the Jurchen's early game plan, though the specifics on that will be gone into later on in the video. Before we move on, let's finish off with the unique technologies. In the Castle Age, the Jurchens get access to Niru. This is a technology that makes it so that any time one of your projectile-based units shoots over one of your cavalry units, it deals 33% more damage. This includes Siege, by the way. Now, this will be tricky to use, and when it works, it will feel amazing, but it really necessitates not only a good amount of micro, but also that you have a combined arms army. This is especially good with the kind of cavalry archer step lancer combo that the civilization is putting you towards because they're both very, very fast. And the step lancers naturally also have a ranged attack, though they do not count as shooting. So it's probably going to be a little bit easier to position them such that your cavalry archers can shoot over them and get the full benefits. In Imperial Age, the Jurchens receive Guaizu Ma. This powerful technology gives every cavalry unit you control bonus melee armor for each other adjacent cavalrymen of yours around them, capping out at plus four. Plus four melee armor is huge and will allow your front lines to be incredibly beefy as long as you're only using horses. Though note that this will also apply to the Cavalry Archer and the Tie Huo Pao. And so as you can see, both of the Jurchen unique technologies are really focusing on mobility and positioning. As always, if you want specifics on any of these bonuses or technologies, check out the Civilization doc. It's linked down below. It's really cool. I put a lot of work into them. I'd love to hear what you think about them in the comments down below. Let's move on to the Jurchen's strengths. First and foremost, what a surprise! They have great cavalry. They would probably have some of the best cavalry in the game. They have almost a perfect tech tree, though they do miss Paladin. 
That being said, when you have the mighty Iron Pagoda Lancer, who needs the Paladin? They have two bonuses that are very nicely geared towards the Step Lancer, that being their stable techs and their line of sight slash gold reduction thing. Speaking of discounted technologies, that stable tech reduction is going to be huge. It's going to let you get to bloodlines way cheaper in Feudal Age for scout rushes. It's going to reduce the barrier to entry for Step Lancers and Hussars, especially in late game. That's going to be where I think a lot of the Jurchen's stable power is going to lie and is going to reward tempo-based gameplay. And that's not even talking about their Guaizima unique technology. The fact that the Jurchens can get their cavalry so tanky if they are playing in a coordinated fashion will ideally help compensate for a lot of the innate weaknesses of a unit like the Step Lancer or the Cavalry Archer. And speaking of archers, wow, I'm on fire with the segues today. The Jurchens have great archers, especially the mounted ones. They, again, almost have a perfect tech tree, no arbalists this time to kind of match the no paladin thing from earlier. And not only do they have bonuses to their cavalry archers, they also have the Tia Huo Pao, which is pretty much an archer unit. It does at least benefit from Nieru because it is a shooting unit. And Nero is going to be one of the strongest things that the Jurchens can do with their archers. While it is hard to use and, re and really rewards good positioning, if you can pull that positioning off, you are going to be almost getting a hill worth of bonuses out of it. Not to mention, it's a perfect complement to the kind of standard knight crossbow thing that people mostly do in Castle Age. So if you can prolong Castle Age and get Nero in there when you have crossbows and knights, forget it. You're going to do fantastically. Lastly, the Jurchens have a really good Castle Age boom. Not only do you have all of those food bonuses pre-Imperial, but the one that you end on in the Castle Age, namely the farming bonus, is really good when you have about four or five town centers all churning out villagers, but all of these bonuses fade as soon as they hit Imperial. So if you can draw out Castle Age after catapulting it from a cheap feudal advance, you can get some serious resource surplus leading into your late game death ball comps. One of the reasons you can do this is because your fortified houses will allow you to much better react to incoming enemy pressure. If you're trying to boom up and the enemy is trying to push through a specific line of your house walls, just upgrade the specific houses being targeted. Or ideally build houses and choke points that you can upgrade in advance so the enemy can't punch through them before the upgrade completes. All of these things, however, put together, give the Jurchens a really interestingly balanced playstyle between offense and defense. On the one hand, you want to be defensive so that you can get your economy bonuses early game. On the other hand, you want to be offensive so you can make use of your incredibly powerful mounted units. But these aren't the only things that the Jurchens can do well. There's a couple other things that they are pretty good at, the first being Siege. Now, they have Siege Onagers with Siege Engineers, and that by itself usually is enough to convince someone that a Siege Workshop is good, right? But they also have their shooting Siege units benefit from the Nieru technology. This even works with Trebuchets, by the way. If you can have units between Trebuchets and a castle, you'll be doing 33% more damage to it, which could make all of the difference in a Treb War or a Slow Push. The downside, however, is you miss Bombard Cannon and Capped Ram. Ooh, that's so bad. So you're stuck with Battering Ram, and you're really reliant on your shooting-based Siege, but those shooting-based Siege will be really good if you're clever with your positioning. Additionally, the Jurchens have a really funky and possibly very annoying House Rush. Fortifies houses gain a shooting attack in Feudal. So the idea would be you would go rushing in with a bunch of villagers, you'd build up a bunch of houses, upgrade them all into fortified houses, get to Feudal Age, and then they'd all start shooting simultaneously. Now, these things do about as much damage as a Feudal Age archer, so not very much, and they have about as much range, too. So they're not going to be a severe threat, but you'll build, be able to build enough of them to be very, very annoying. Uh, enough so that I could see this strategy being overpowered. So if it is, we will, we will change it. The main upside of this versus a normal Tower Rush is that they are cheaper, so you can get more of them, but they're a lot slower to build and lower damage. So if enemy villagers can get on top of your house before it has upgraded, they can pretty much neutralize it before it was ever a threat. And I should note that villagers would deal bonus damage to fortified houses in the same way that they do to towers, and fortified houses do have a minimum range. But the Jurchens have one other thing that helps out this annoying little strategy, namely that they have a cheaper feudal age and a really strong early food economy, which hopefully should give them enough of a surplus that they can send a couple of forward villagers out without worrying about being too far behind. Now, do I want the strategy to be good? No. But do I want it to be an option? If tower rushing has to be an option, then this should be an option as well, okay? And I think that there's enough counterplay that it shouldn't be too cancerous. No more than a normal tower rush is, at the very least. God, I hate them so much. 
Now, the Jurchens are not without their weaknesses. In fact, they have plenty, the first of which being their infantry. Like many of their Turco-Mongolic sister civilizations, the Jurchens have garbage infantry and miss so much. They don't have champions, pikemen, plate mail armor, or squires. It is dog do. They're stuck with spears who are slow, and they don't get any benefits from any of their unique technologies or bonuses whatsoever. Lastly, the Jurchen's late game army really wants to be mobile, and if they aren't mobile, they need to be shooting, and infantry do neither of those things. So in general, if you are the Jurchen's, you are only ever making infantry in either a man-at-arms rush to respond to early scouts from your opponent, or maybe to counter eagle warriors in early Imperial Age or late castle. Apart from that, don't do it. You're fighting a losing battle. Secondly, the Jurchens have a very weak Imperial Age eco, much weaker than their earlier game eco would ever imply. As mentioned, their food bonuses stop working as soon as they hit Imperial Age. They don't get any further benefits after that point. But in addition to that, they are missing a lot of critical technologies once again. But they do still have all of the farming upgrades, so at the very least they won't be completely helpless in these scenarios. You are going to be a lot less efficient than some other post-imperial builds though, so you'll have to be a little more cautious with how you are spending your units. And lastly, the Jurchens have a fairly substantial weakness to enemy cavalry units. They don't have any unit that really effectively deals anti-cavalry damage. They obviously don't have camels, and their spear line is stuck at spears. Not only that, but since the Jurchens have such a positioning-dependent comp, even though they themselves are mobile, the main way to beat a positioning-based strategy is to be mobile yourselves. And as such, enemy cavalry will do much better against a lot of the Jurchens' normal strategies than other unit types and comps might otherwise. This is pretty much the reason why I gave a little bit of anti-cavalry damage to the Iron Pagoda, because I figured in post-imperial scenarios, it would be incredibly oppressive to try to fight a strong paladin civilization, for example, with the Jurchens, and not have a single thing that does well against them. It's not common that you see a cavalry civilization have trouble with cavalry itself. And I find that to be a very interesting dynamic that I think is quite fitting for this particular civilization. And so now that we have a better picture of the Jurchen's strengths and weaknesses, let's give a quick summary of their playstyle. What do I think it would look like when you're playing them in-game on average? Well, first of all, in the early game, you want to typically play defensive. You're upgrading your houses when attacked, but for the most part, you want to keep your strong early economy churning as best as you can. Once you hit Feudal, with a cheap advance and cheap bloodlines, you can launch into a very good scout rush, fueled by that massive food economy that you started going strong in Dark Age. And if the enemy counter rushes you, you can just build fortified houses, and by this point they can shoot. And if you want to stay unpredictable, the Jurchens can do a purposely serviceable archer and even a man-at-arms rush, so you aren't 100% locked into scouts, even though it is typically going to be your best option. Once you hit the mid-game, however, the Jurchens will really start to hit their stride. You have that massive farming bonus, so you can boom, boom, boom if you want to, like me, but if you want to play more aggressive, you have all sorts of strats open there as well. You're pushed towards cavalry archers and step lancers, but you have very serviceable knights that are fully upgraded in castle. You have very serviceable crossbows that are fully upgraded in castle. And frankly, the world is your oyster. If you want to prolong castle age and get Nero, you can even have a really, really good power spike before you even hit imperial age. But for the most part in castle age, you want to capitalize on your farming as much as possible and ideally draw out castle age a little bit, either by booming or through a lot of unrelenting aggression. And in Imperial Age and onwards, you have one of the strongest cavalry death balls in the game. This is going to be better than the Huns in many scenarios, simply because of the inter-unit synergies. You want your Iron Pagodas, and you want your Cavalry Archers. But besides that, you actually have a couple of other pretty valid things you can do too. Your Hussars are perfectly good, they're fully upgraded, and you have the Tia Huo Pao, and those are going to do a ton of damage, even if they're a little more comp-specific in terms of what your opponent is playing. But don't forget, you do have some slower support units too, and they benefit from Nieru, so as long as you aren't going too far afield, they can do a lot of work. Elite Skirms, Hand Cannons, Siege Onagers, you have them all. The main thing you have to worry about as the Jurchens post-Imperial is that your economy is much weaker than at any other stage in the game. So you're going to need to close out based on the strength of your troops rather than your endurance. With all of that being said, let's talk about a couple of loose threads before we wrap up. These were ideas or questions I had during design that I didn't quite come to satisfying answers on, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on them down in the description below. First of all, a couple of uncertainties I had about the build. The staggered gather bonuses 
I anticipated being possibly awkward and possibly disliked. Typically, when you have an eco bonus, you're counting on it for the entire game. And I could see some people really disliking it and it being very hard to play for anyone besides the most committed players. Secondly, when I was deep in design after having committed substantially to the cheaper feudal team bonus, I realized how disgusting that bonus could be in team games. Like, imagine a 4v4 team game where the enemy team all get to feudal age like 20 seconds ahead of you. That, that could be really oppressive. And if it was too much, I could see toning it down, but I really like the concept of the bonus, you know what I mean? So I'd like to keep the idea if possible, and maybe I'm overestimating how bad it would be in teams, but alarm bells went off in my head, you know what I mean? So I'd like to hear your thoughts down in the comments below on this subject in particular. To wrap up with a couple of fun things, let's go over some of the ideas I had for the civilization but decided not to use for one reason or another. The first one being, I thought that military units would be able to hunt animals. This was a part of my design for a while, and obviously it's central to a lot of the Civ's theming and history. Um, the main reason I didn't go with this is it felt a little overloaded. I liked the staggered eco bonus better, and I think that this will work much better on another Civ that I have in the works for the distant future. So this one I did not not go with because I didn't like it, I just think it could work even better elsewhere. A similar idea I had was that while your soldiers were fighting, there would be a trickle of food while they were attacking any enemy unit. Like a Keshek, but for all your guys and for food instead of gold. To kind of represent like, you know, them going out and hunting in the middle of the campaign or whatever. Um, cool idea. I could see this working quite well. And if people ended up really hating the staggered eco bonus, we could do this one instead fairly comfortably, though I think I missed the staggered eco. Uh, next, I had an idea where archers could have an attack bonus versus cavalry. Seems nice and simple. My idea was that it would be based on the idea of hunting. You're shooting the horse, you know? You're hunting some horse meat for dinner. Uh, perhaps a little silly, perhaps a little reductive. It's a lot more streamlined than my designs tend to be, and that's why I didn't go with it. But especially if we find that the cavalry weakness is just too much, I could see this being a necessary implementation. Another idea I had for a civilization bonus would be that husbandry was free from feudal age. Uh, this would be obviously huge for their scout rush. I thought a little too huge. I liked the Jurchens being a little more of a castle age civilization than feudal age. In a similar vein of it just being a little too much, I at one point had their tech tree miss Bowsaw, the second woodcutting tech. This would obviously utterly hamstring their economy, especially a little later in the game, which at one point I thought would be necessary considering how good their food eco would be early on, but it felt really too mean. I Like, maybe if they're just an economic juggernaut we could do this, but uh, I don't think so. Not right now. And lastly, 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 I had an idea at one point where Guaizama would give you temporary armor when hurt. This would only be for cavalry units. So if a cavalry unit was hit, they get a little bit of armor for a little while. Uh, cool idea, but I think that the current incarnation is only a lot cooler and fits a lot better with the Jurchen's theme of like strategy and mobility. But also it would be another of those bonuses that would have like a hidden timer that was hard to track. Uh, and while I don't hate those, and I don't mind putting them into some of my designs, uh, the Jurchens are a nice, clean, elegant design by my standards, and I didn't want to overcomplicate them unnecessarily, you know what I mean? I know, shocking, right? It's This is me we're talking about, I'm saying I didn't want to overcomplicate things. But anyways, let's round it off with a couple of cool unique unit and unique technology ideas that I decided not to go with. Uh, first of them being a hunting dog. God, I've wanted this in Age of Empires for ages. Uh, I'm sure it will find its way into one of my videos someday, but the Jurchens were really, really close with dogs. They loved dogs, and the Chinese thought they were crazy for this. So my idea here was that this would be a Dark Age available unique unit that would have some anti-infantry damage and could help you hunt. Uh, another unique unit I had was the Bela. This is the name of a, of a, a leader or a clan leader. Um, and this would be a cavalry archer unit that would buff units that it shoots over. So you see I had this shoot over idea early in design. Um, in this particular case, it wasn't that I didn't like the shoot over effect, I, I actually quite did, but not only would it be another of those hidden buffs that are hard to track, but a Bela was a leader, and the idea of you building an army of leaders if you like only made Bela seemed kind of dumb. For unique technologies, I had one called Buigun. This was in my build right up until like the last draft, and this would make it so that every house next to a military building would speed up that military building's production speed. This was when I came up with the idea for Niru, which I think is like one of the coolest ideas I've had in one of these videos so far. So Buigun was kicked down the road. Uh, another idea I had was Halamukun. This was 
a term referring to Jurchen clan structure and kind of social hierarchy overall. And this technology would allow you to produce villagers from any military building, or specifically barracks, archery range, stable. It'd be much slower than from a town center. Uh, I love this effect. I think it's so cool. But once again, it felt misplaced when I was trying to focus the civilization so much towards cohesion and mobility and positioning. And lastly, a unique technology called Warka, which would allow infantry to farm. Yes, the Jurgens have garbage infantry. Yes, that's why I decided not to go with this. Yes, I still think it's a cool idea and we'll probably put it on another civilization someday. And with all of that, we finally come to the end of my Jurchen's build. Thank you so much for watching. Before we sign off, as always today, let's take a gander at the old likelyometer. In my opinion, my humble opinion, how likely is it that a civilization called the Jurchen's, looking something a little bit like my build from them here, might appear in Age of Empires at some point in the future? And for the Jurchen's, our likelyometer score is a 4 out of 10. That's pretty low, isn't it? Well, my reason for it is I think it's very unlikely that despite them deserving it, despite them needing it, despite it making so much sense for it to happen, I don't think the Chinese will ever be subdivided. And that is largely for political reasons. Suffice to say that Age of Empires 2 is fairly decently sized in China, and I don't think that the Microsoft team will want to jeopardize that relationship. But in any sensible and just world, I think that this number on the likelyometer goes from a 4 to like a 9. <laughs> but all that being said, how did you like my build? What did you think of this? Do you think that there's anything that I could have done differently to better reflect their history or to better balance them? Do you see any issues that I missed? Are there any things that you specifically liked or thought I did well? Uh, I personally think that this is one of the most grounded, sensible, streamlined designs I've ever come up with. Uh, and it's still freaking weird, so that should tell you something. <laughs> but either way, I'd love to hear from you down below in the comment section, and above all else, I'd like to hear what you think I should do next. A civilization, a unit, something like that. I've got some great suggestions so far from comments that I'm starting to build a little priority list out of, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring and give me another suggestion, I would absolutely love to hear from you. And with all that being said, I thank you so much for watching. As always, my name has been Robbie Howell. And ciao for now.